Everybody, so today we're starting off with this exercise that you're just getting. Um, the, I hope everybody is excited for the Soccer World Cup <laughs> that is happening soon. And to get you all in the mood, here's an exercise of the German Bundesliga uh, ranking this, this table. And so what you're supposed to be doing is to kind of like uh, try to design a visualization, again in a team, showing the ranking of these football clubs over time. Thank you. Yeah, I haven't got it to everyone. Uh, okay, I'll, I'll, yeah. Oh, wait, yeah. Yeah, let's see. Yeah. Are we submitting these for the uh, activities? Yeah. What about the previous exercise? Sure. Yeah, yeah, up to five. Yeah. We have one bonus one, right? Uh, the bonus one is going to be a special thing. Oh, sorry. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Can you take one for the colleague up there? Thank you. Thank 
So it's like I, I don't know. I just have to see how many balls that person needs to cut out. But I'm coming Yeah. Are they not important, but they like the first? Two are one color, the last uh, ones are a color, so. But that's the rank. Uh, yes, good. So the colors is just like the, the, the leader is green, right? The second place is blue, and the relegation five and six are red. But it doesn't really matter here. Yep.
Okay, everybody. So, what did you come up with? A line chart. And so, how, how did your line chart look? So what are we drawing? What what were you drawing on the y-axis of your line chart? Uh, the, the, so the rank. Yeah, the okay. Anybody else uh, have a different design? Okay, so basically a line chart, but inverts, inverted scale, so that the number one team is at the top. Yeah. Yeah, so having kind of like some additional context on the uh, on the map. Yeah. Yes, as an option. Having the points on a line chart by the rankings, right? Uh, you could, but you know, uh, what if uh, if a tie? <laughs> you know, in sports, usually there is solutions for ties, right? So, uh, for example, in soccer, it's then a direct comparison. Uh, like, have you, like, if there's a tie in points, they look at the record between the two teams that are tied. Uh, and if the one team is better in the direct comparison, uh, then that would be ranked on top, right? So, there's two different pieces of information here. Yeah. Do lanes like on the horse race, basically, or band? Yeah, yeah, that sounds that sounds interesting. A little bit of a variation on the line chart. And so, anybody thought more about the point visualization idea? Yeah. I did the point visualization with the uh, impact now, but kind of how we did in the COVID uh, visualization, like for the climate, um, like when your mouse is sort of like user like highlights over it, it shows the range of like possible Okay. Cool. So, like a details on demand uh, approach. Yeah. 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 Um, well, you came up with like a split cell, like keeping the table layout, but doing the split cell. And, you know, you have the ranking as one half of the cell, and then the other half. Um, you could either do a number encoding, but you could also do color. You could do something to show the points, bar graph, whatever you want. Yeah. Yeah. I like all of these ideas. Yeah, that that would work. That you would have to have like fairly thick lines, right, so that you notice which one is on top of the other. But that could conceivably work. Cool. Well, um, this is a simple problem, right? Um, and still, there's a lot of design variation that we can up with and come up with. And rankings are, are something that we often have to deal with, right? Um, why do you think generally rankings are so important to us? Exactly. I think this is really nails it, right? We, we use rankings because we're lazy. Uh, and because we want to say somebody won, right? Uh, those two drives that we have are, are useful. And so if we pick a college or a school, we look at their rankings because it's just much too difficult for an individual to understand the whole complexity of the nuances of like a university, right? So the rankings make it easy for us to assess relative qualities between two different, uh, two different kind of options. And in sports, of course, it's all about winning. 
Uh, and so rankings are really what tells you who is winning and who gets eternal glory. Um, and so ranking is, is kind of like this, this interesting area. It's tabular data visualization. So, and, and I think that basically a lot of you came up with this design here, right? Uh, this bump chart design here. Um, but I also like, well, I guess the other, the other, like maybe your solution was a little bit more, most like this, right? So if you have ordered bars, you can you, you essentially have a ranking, but you also have numbers, but then you wouldn't have the temporal information, right? So you would, could pay, you could ideal, like in, in theory, you could just have like one little bar chart uh, for, or one group of bar charts for every single round in a soccer tournament, right? That would be an option that would probably work. Um, and so, um, yeah, I'll talk a little bit about these in, in some more detail, um, but I wanna show like this particular ex exercise was inspired by a paper by Jacques, uh, Charles Perrin and Romain Vimont and, and Jean-Daniel Fiquet uh, that was published at CHI in 2014. Um, and I'll show the video here because it's just a nice video. We present At Table, an interactive table improving temporal net. Soccer ranking tables. Standard ranking tables for soccer championships place teams in rows and points in other statistics and columns, such as the number of wins or the number of goals achieved. Teams are ranked according to one column. By default, the accumulated number of points. In a championship, the values of the dimensions for each change each time a team plays the game. Thus, the table contents and row ordering change each day of the game. Without visual help, it is almost impossible to track changes, observe team evolution, or generally perform temporal tasks. To perform temporal tasks, well known visualization and interaction may help, such as sliders, crowds, and temporal dimensions. Animated transitions and row highlighting to follow a team. Column sorting to rank teams according to the specific dimension. However, performing complex temporal tasks is difficult using these generic. We introduce two new interactive techniques. So, interestingly, nobody used time, right, in their solution, right? Because you already asked to draw on a paper and you didn't have interaction, right? But uh, here you could, in theory, you could have like a time slider, right, and look at the table and have some animations that would also help. Um, but of course, then we have the problem of comparing between different time points. Yes. Uh, yeah, but what I mean is by, you know, um, that you have a slider that you can switch to different rounds and then you have just a table visualization, right? To enhance temporal navigation, we rank the table. Drive style is a direct manipulation technique to drive time by interacting the value domain of the time domain. First, the user mouse clicks the cell corresponding to a team's dimension. By dragging the mouse up and down, he explores the value domain of the cell. Arrows indicate a preview of each team's behavior if the mouse clicks be released, and a temporal slider displays feedback. When releasing the mouse, the table changes to the time at which the team has the selected value. The arrows disappear. For example, let's answer the following common question addressed by soccer analysts. When did a team reach the theoretical number of points, 42, to be safe from being downgraded to the minor league? Using traditional interaction techniques, the user would browse the temporal dimension to find the first time at which a particular team, here, Montpellier, obtains a value greater or equal to 42 in the points column. Using drag cell, the user interacts directly with the value domain to perform the task making the interaction more direct and faster. The second technique, this rank, uses line charts as a temporary overview of the change. First, the user clicks the cell corresponding to a team and its dimension. This rank animates the table into a timeline format by widening the columns of rows. The y-axis of the chart represents the selected dimension's value, while the x-axis represents time. One line chart is displayed for each previously selected in semantically resonant colors, an inspector shows the values of each line chart. This rank provides two scales, an absolute scale, mapping line charts on the dimension values, and a relative scale, mapping line charts on the rank. The user can also select or unselect teams to show or hide their corresponding line chart. Finally, clicking the overview chart transforms it back into a table to see the inverse translation with the selected time value. 
So yeah, um, basically some of the ideas that we talked about, right? But just a dynamic transition between points and ranks, which is kind of very cool, and all of this combined with interaction. So this is a very fancy implementation, obviously, but it just shows you that, like, that, that these kinds of things are possible. Okay. Um, another thing, um, especially if you don't have multiple rankings to compare, uh, very useful are these tabular representations, right? So the table lens is a, a classical implementation of kind of like a graphical spreadsheet. Um, and yeah, I'll just play this video briefly. For example, this list table is a 1986 baseball statistic with 323 rows of players and 23 columns of data. We can put the data into a spreadsheet, but even using a 21 inch workstation display, the data requires nine full screen vertical scrolls and two horizontal scrolls, making it hard to work with. It's hard to find players or see interesting patterns. In short, it's hard to make sense of information. We've devised a new way of visualizing and interacting with large tables called the table lens, which exploits graphical representations to compress the information onto the display. In this column, at that, we integrate a familiar bar chart representation directly into the textual view of the table. Some of the rows, those in focus, show underlying textual values along with the graphical bar. Other rows, those in the context, show only graphical representations, thus requiring less space. By displaying the entire table graphically with only some of it in focus, the 324 row by 24 column table can be shown using a portion of the screen. The table lens displays 30 to 100 times as much information as the spreadsheet in the same space. With a small set of manipulation operations, the table lens allows fluid navigation and exploration of the data. The focus area can be manipulated using control points and or keyboard commands. The number of cells in the focal area can be increased or decreased. The focal area can be moved to different rows or columns. Since the essential geometry of the table is preserved, multiple focal areas can be created. Facilitate browsing with context cell values, a mouse feedback area at the bottom of the window shows column, row, and value information. The graphical representations make it easy to spot trends and patterns and to isolate outliers or unusual cases. For example, sorting the column can reveal relationships to other columns. Here, sorting career at bat reveals correlations in several nearby columns. Notice that career hits is strongly correlated or proportional to at bat. In other words, most players have similar batting averages. Some players stick out from the curve. Two well-known batting stars, Wade Boggs and Don Mattingly. Okay, so you get the idea. Confirm these observations. We divide career hits by career app. Okay. Yeah, and so um, then I wanted to talk a little bit about what, ha what if you have composite rankings, right? So for example, university rankings are frequently scored by like a, a handful of metrics. Um, and then you might have like different, um, you might have different metrics in there that you care about more or less. And so this is like a, a thing that we, um, Timon uh, and I built um, a couple of years ago um, where we were kind of like looking to democratize these kind of compound rankings. So what happens if you have um, a ranking that is, for example, you have faculty student ratio as one of the things that you uh, want to visual, uh, want to consider, but you also have, you know, the overall quality of the faculty or the score in computer science or in engineering, right? And you might want to emphasize this over maybe the arts program or maybe the opposite, depending on which kind of student you are, right? Um, and so what we came up with is kind of like this tabular representation. So first we show in the table, we show you the rank and then we show you a university name. And then we show a score and that score we show as a bar chart. And so now we have both the rank and we also have this, the score uh, information. So the quantitative information. And now we can actually tell, you know, how much is the difference between two ranked elements. That's from just the ranking, you couldn't tell that, right? Um, but what we really want to do here is support multiple attributes. And so what we did is we came up with a couple of different functions. And so the simplest one is the weighted sum, right? So let's suppose the ranking is composed of three different attributes, A, B, and C. We can simply create a weighted sum um, like this. So where we simply multiply a weight with each of these scores. Um, but we could also like, 
uh, envision scenarios where we care about the maximum, right? Or we could do something more complicated such as product or nesting. Um, and so we developed a few graphical um, kind of combiner functions, uh, the serial and the parallel combiner, in addition to complex combiners. And I'll show you the serial combiner first. So let's suppose I have like A, B, C as these different attributes. And if I wanted to say, hey, like A could be like our uh, faculty student ratio, and I really want, uh, want to focus on having good faculty supervision in my degree, I could say, um, this is really much more important to me. Uh, or first year, actually, what I can do is if I have the three, I can just combine them and uh, have them show them as a stacked bar, right? And now as a stacked bar, I can still see the individual contributions, but I also can get, get the overall score. And now if I want to adjust the weight of A, um, I can like just manually drag this and then readjust this and then update the ranking here, right? So that would be like a simple idea. Um, and so this is how we implemented this. We are starting off with faculty student ratio, employee reputation and citations per faculty. In the system, you could uh, drag and drop and resize and so on, so that you can kind of uh, generate a table as you want. And then you can kind of like sort by each individual columns, or you can take any of the columns and create a combined ranking based on these columns. So now we have like a combined, uh, ranking of the, or a combined uh, score for now uh, of these three columns. And then if we sort by that, we get our combined ranking. And then we can start adjusting particular elements. So we're highlighting here Yale. Uh, and when we adjust the weights, like right now they're all weighted equally, we can see how things are moving. And now that we do some animation and also some kind of like color highlighting just to um, like the animation can be over quickly, but the color stays a little bit longer so that they have a chance to, uh, to see what was going on. So this works great. Um, however, this always assumes that a high value is good, right? And there's definitely situations where this isn't the case, right? So where we have to do some data transformation first. And so what we thought about there is, uh, well, can't we do some flexible mapping of attributes to scores? And so let's suppose in, uh, if we have the like high is good in the score, we just have like a linear mapping, right? So we have an input data set from zero to hundred and we map this to the unit interval. And then we see our bar here at top that corresponds to that particular orange position here. Um, but let's suppose we have an inverted uh, score. Then for example, an input of 20, would mean roughly like 0 0.6 um, in, in, as the bar here. So here lower is good. Um, we also played around with this um, kind of like more than a representation in an X and a Y axis in mathematical, like a mathematical function would. And we actually did like a small user study and everybody hated this um, except for mathematicians, <laughs> uh, which was kind of interesting. And so here's what this looks like. Here we have, uh, arts and humanities scores, engineering, technology, life science, uh, and medicine. And now we can kind of like manipulate the scores here. Like what is the raw data versus what is the score? So we can kind of like do a filter here that I don't consider anybody with like scores lower than 40. Uh, here's the complex uh, or here's the graphical combiner where you have X and Y axis. And here I could kind of do nonlinear scores. And you even see in this little box at the bottom, you see what the corresponding code is. Um, and you could even like select from a ser series of pre, uh, in pre-selected um, functions. So for example, inversion. So now Virginia Polytech here ends up at the top because they have the worst arts and humanities score. Uh, not surprising for a technical college, right? Um, and so, yeah, we played around with this. Um, and then the other thing we could do is a little bit like our temporal aspect that we had in the exercise, we want to compare rankings, right? How, does, how do rankings change over the years? Um, and so what we did here is we, we essentially created multiples of these rankings, each for one year, and then we show bump charts between them, right? So it's kind of like a simple idea again. Um, then you can highlight one um, and see where is the particular university over the years, or, or not over the years, but also in different conditions, right? Let's suppose uh, I compare arts uh, ranking versus uh, engineering ranking, right? I could do this, it doesn't have to be temporal. Uh, and so here's why we would do that. We can just take a snapshot um, and then we can uh, explore a ranking um, in any of these um, different uh, views. And you can see as this changes, the position changes and we see these bump charts appear. 
And if the differences are too big, uh, we, we show like just an arrow that points downwards, right? If, if one of the, the two elements is not on the screen. And you can see a difference in rank shown in the second column and so on. If you want to play with this, this, uh, this is like now a JavaScript um, or TypeScript based tool. You can kind of like uh, integrate this even in your projects, right? There is like a, a simple version that is based on React. Uh, there is like a more complicated version that is like a little bit tricky to use, but um, you know, fairly sophisticated. Um, the, the one little funny thing is that whenever I give a talk about this, some university administrator asks me, well, how can I make my university look best, right? Uh, <laughs> It's a very common request, and we, we purposefully avoided giving you an option of like optimizing the ranking of one particular item, right? Because I think it's nice to be able to explore, but you clearly, you know, there, there are some ethical uh, questions to ask here. Great, so this was it with ranking. And now I want to move on to maps. And very timely about maps is that a lot of this will be about elections. Uh, I don't have any up to date elections stuff, but you will still see. A lot of election things. So here are two problematic maps. Take a second to look at them and tell me why is the left one here problematic? This is a tweet by Donald Trump, by the way. Exactly. So what do we say? People vote, not, not a surface area does, right? Uh, and so that's the problem with this particular map. Any other comments about this? What's the problem with the second map? Yeah. Greenland is not bigger. <laughs> exactly. Greenland is not bigger than Africa, and then Arctica is not half of the land mass of the world, right? Uh, so what's going on here is we're using like a problematic projection. And so these are two very common problems with maps that you have to think about. So here's like a more specific example. The Kerry versus Bush map in 2004, it looks like the Bush won like an amazing victory, right? Just like uh, try to impeach this map from Trump. Uh, but in fact, if you um, change this to the popular vote and you show those two bar charts, you, you see it wasn't like close by modern standards, but it was 3 million difference, right? Uh, so much, much more subtle. Whereas the amount of red or blue shown in the map is extremely different, right? So this effect of showing population versus showing area is very important in maps. So um, the principles of map visualization is Maps are a special type of spatial data, and we should maps really, we should use maps really only when spatial relationships are the most important thing to show in your data. So tasks in a map, and if any of those is what you really want to support, then you should use a map, right? You want to find location or a feature, like a county, country, city, or street. Do you want to find a route or identify attributes associated with the location? So for example, like what's the elevation on the slope that I want to ski down, right? Uh, or what's the, uh, is it land or water? Or what's the GDP there? Or if you want to compare attributes between locations and features. Um, the most important principle that I always tell you, if you want to draw a map, ask yourself this question. Do we really need a map? Uh, because it's often easier to not use a map. Uh, because maps kind of like, you know, maps allow you, like the, uh, they, they take away position. So you can't design anything. You have to position something on the map. And so it's a little bit more tricky. And so this is actually probably my favorite election visualization of all times. And it's about, you know, over the years, over the decades, how states have shifted, right? And so you see essentially like the, the different states, who did they vote for? Was it a Republican or was it a Democrat in, in all of these different election campaigns? Um, and we can see, for example, the, um, you know, Romney, what's the far right outlier here? Utah, of course. <laughs> but we also see that Utah isn't like, you know, Romney is a special candidate for Utah. So it's not historically that um, Utah always, well, Utah always votes Republican, but not that far uh, on, on the extreme side of the spectrum, right? So it's not usually the most Republican state in the, in the union. Um, and so, you know, this complexity of information as you have it here is something that it would be like, you know, try to show me a century of election history on a map. That's almost impossible, right? So um, you, if, you, if you don't use spatial position, you can show more information. And especially if you show information about US states to an American audience, people know where California is, right? You don't actually need to show them a map to remind them that California is on the left side of the country. Um, 
And so if you don't show a map, you can do more complex things. So like this is from, uh, uh, from the Clinton Trump election. And um, I, I really like that. Well, there was this, this, there's a few pieces here. First, um, they show these kind of like cones of our, these, these, uh, these probability um, values here, right? So this was during the, like as the race was being called. Um, and you could see that while this was called for Clinton, like this was Colorado, you could also see that the outcome could be anywhere from like uh, plus 1% to plus 6%. Um, and this kind of information is again, really hard to show on a map because you don't have the space to show it on the map. Um, but if you want a map, uh, you have to pick a map projection. And so why do we need to do projections? Well, you know, we usually display maps on flat things, right? On paper or on our phones or on a computer display. Of course, there are spherical displays, but they're more like museum pieces, right? Um, and so what we need to do if we want to like show the surface of a, of a sphere on a flat surface is we need to do some projection. And the thing is, it's never going to be perfect. It's always going to be wrong in some way. And basically, if we choose a projection, we kind of optimize in which way our map is wrong. Um, and so some of the things that you want to think about uh, are what do you want to optimize? Do you want to optimize area, shape, direction, bearing, distance, or scale? Right? These are the, the things that you might care about. And if you like map projections, here's like a quiz uh, by XKCD that kind of like, you know, tells you your personality type based on your favorite map. Um, so the simple solution, of course, is use a globe, right? If you can use a globe, a globe is great. Uh, but a globe has certain disadvantages, right? Like here, I would need interaction to, for example, show both the, like, um, the United States and Europe at the same time or show um, Australia and the United States at the same time, right? So this doesn't work. Um, and globes, yeah, are, are great, but, you know, like limited useful. Um, the most kind of like, you know, historically the most used projection is the Mercator projection, which was um, developed by its namesake, Gerardus Mercator in 1569. And that's a very simple projection, right? What you do is you have the sphere of the earth, you wrap a cylinder of paper around it, and you just like project out onto the cylinder of paper. And that's what the Mercator projection does. Um, the nice thing here is angles are preserved and you have lines of constant bearing are straight lines, which is kind of like important when you use a map to navigate, right? Especially at sea. Um, so constant bearing means constant compass heading. And so this was like a map that was useful for sailors. Um, and so here is like the like a D3 uh, implementation of the Mercado projection. And as you already said, like, you know, Antarctica is way too big. Greenland is way too big. Africa is, in fact, many, many times bigger than uh, Greenland. But um, and the Mercator projection also kind of like keeps the shapes consistent, right? Circular objects are circular. So here's the Mercator projection of Mars. And you see that the circular craters um, are actually circular on this map. And so why is the Mercator pro um, projection problematic? Well, it's mostly problematic because it was used to teach geography. And it is a massive distortion of area distant from the equator. So it's kind of like unfair to the global south, making places that are mostly trees, snow, and better off white people look huge. And the places where most of the world's population live look puny. Uh, and so I, I really like this quote, so I'm going to read it out. McCarter works really well if you say, Ferdinand Magellan looking for a compass bearing that will take you around Cape Horn because all of the latitude and longitude lines and angles in between lay out nice and straight on the map like we experience them in real life. It also works well if you Google and you want a map image that you can neatly slice up into little squares that your server sends to customers' browsers. North is always up. Your hometown doesn't look squished or slanted when you zoom in and everybody's happy. Um, but of course, this is the problem, right? Uh, like this is an actual uh, two-scale map, right? So you, in, in, you can fit China, the United States, Argentina, India, Western Europe, uh, and uh, yeah, you cannot fit all of these kind of countries or regions into Africa, right? And that's something that intuitively we don't understand, right? Um, and if we were to rescale the Mercator projection to the true size of the country, we see these extreme differences, right? So especially Greenland and Russia, but also Canada, uh, even though Russia and Canada are still the largest countries, they're not, it's not that much different from other countries, right? Um, so you can see these effects very pronounced. And you can also 
play with this. Um, you can just Google for Mercator puzzle if you want to do that. Uh, but here you have certain countries and um, you can drag them around and try to think where it fits. So here, what is this country? It's Indonesia, maybe. Yeah, looks good. It is Indonesia. Um, then here we have this country that, and you can see the effect, right? If I put this on top of Greenland, it's about as big as Greenland. Yeah. It's, what do you say, Bolivia? Libya. Yeah, it's Libya. So Libya is about the size. Doesn't lock. Yeah, now it locked in. Libya is about the size of Greenland. Who knew, right? Uh. <laughs> So really, like this is this is quite uh, quite an effect that that we have here, right? So definitely, like play with this um, because it's very visceral if you do it yourself. Uh, the caveat is um, this is of course only a problem for large areas. Like if you show the world, this is a problem. If you show Salt Lake City, this is not a problem, right? Uh, and so on a state city level or in a smaller level, this is totally fine to use because. It kind of makes some of the things easy, like slicing up things neatly into squares for serving them. Um, one other thing you can do is we have latitude and longitude measures, right? So what we could just do is we could just plot them. And that's like an actually cool representation. If, if you get a, a geographical data set and you, you have a plotting library, you can just plot them without doing anything, right? Um, and that works, but it gets kind of like it doesn't preserve angles, it doesn't preserve areas. And then you get this squished stuff at the top and the bottom. And so you have these kind of like, you know, this isn't how we think of the world. Um, then we have azimuthal projections. This is kind of like the projecting uh, the Earth onto a plane tangent to the Earth. Uh, here, angles are correct around the center of the point. So this is really like a map that is useful if you want to show the rest of the world relative to one point, right? Uh, and the great circle through the center are straight lines. The radii kind of correspond to true distances. And this would be something that you would see in an airline magazine around the hub. Um, and so if you, like, this is an azimuthal equidistant map in D3. And here's just like from a magazine, from the Time Life magazine, um, showing essentially how, where the reporters are and how their reporters move between different countries, right? So kind of intriguing, um, but, but yeah, you know, unusual at least. And then the Winkle triple projection is a modified azimuthal map projection, which is averaged to the cylindrical projection. Um, and it minimizes three kinds of distortions, area, direction, and distance. And this is kind of like now a day is considered the map that you should be using if you want to show the world in like a geography context, right? This is endorsed by the National Geographic Society and is in, used in modern textbooks, right? And so this is what, um, how it is constructed. It's like the mean of the azimuthal and equirectangular projection. Um, and the result is something like this, right? Um, and so that's kind of like, you know, uh, a fair projection that like, you know, Greenland is still maybe like a little bit bigger than it is supposed to be, but you know, you get a good sense of, of what is going on. And, uh, and Africa looks, looks like definitely larger than Europe, right? Which it is by many, many times. Um, and so all of this does make sense. And if we were to plot, Circles of equal size, this is what we would get, right? So you can get a, get a bit of an idea of the distortion on this map. And you can see that it's like, you know, yes, the circle here in the middle is a little bit smaller than the circles here on top. And, uh, and the ones in the top are squished, especially in the sides. But, you know, you always have to compromise. And this is a reasonable compromise. Uh, a map that is important for um, US projections is the Alvarez equal area. This shows areas correctly, but distorts distances and shapes. Um, and then when one very cool project is that, like, actually, you can use different projections um, depending, like, there's kind of like an optimal projection depending on, on where you are in a map, right? So, for example, here we have this diagram of what this particular person, or this is like a, a research paper from a geography department, what they consider to be the optimal uh, projection for certain zoom levels and positions. So if I, if I zoom in here, uh, you can see here, this is kind of like where I am at the bottom. And if I keep zooming in, I'm moving around here. And then if I move down here, I get to Alvarez Koenig and so on. And then if I, if I continue zooming in, I eventually, and the Mark, Mercator one doesn't work, but essentially, eventually it becomes the Mercator projection. So you could kind of like build a system like this 
that uh, picks a projection based on the zoom factor where you're at. And actually Google Maps does a little bit something like this, right? So the modern Google Maps implementations, they actually switch to a globe, right? Um, so it's kind of like, you know, here we are probably on a Mercator projection, but as we zoom out, it actually switches to a globe. Um, and that's like, you know, that, that, that didn't, um, that's a fairly new thing, right? Because graphics like this weren't possible 10 years ago. So D3, as you know, has many of these projections included. Um, there is like really, really a ton of them. Um, and, you know, choosing between them for your for task is, is, is one thing that you should consider when you want to show a map. So next I want to talk a little bit about map software for navigation, right? Because well, there's data visualization, but you, we also use maps uh, a lot for navigation. And, and it's kind of like interesting, like, like the two, I guess there's Apple Maps and there's Google Maps and there's OpenStreetMap, right? And so these have like, you know, Google Maps has become this kind of information portal that is what much more than an Apple Maps, much more than uh, just geographical information. But, you know, they, they started out as maps uh, and they started out as navigation tools. And so, what I kind of like about many of these modern navigation tools is that they have these two ways of working, right? There's the, um, especially like in the Google Maps, you can, um, if you want to navigate with public transit, you get this view that is very abstract, right? Because when you navigate with public transit, you actually don't necessarily need to know uh, the exact location, right? As you would if you were walking by foot or driving with a car, you just need to know what are my connections, where are my connections, how many stops, and so on, right? And so that's a different level of information than uh, having to drive with a car. And so Google Maps has a special interface for doing this. And so if I wanted to go for a margarita after this class, and I want to go down to the Rio Grande Cafe, um, this would be like the map that you could use for that um, if you wanted to use public transport instead of walking. And so here I see I have to take the bus here. Uh, I first walk a little bit, then I take the bus at the Kennecott building, um, and then I get off at this street and then walk a, lot, a little bit again. And here's kind of like the, the abstract representation. And here's the specific representation of that. And so it turns out when humans describe path, which is maybe something given the probably like you're a lot younger than me. Um, and so you probably haven't actually described any, but to, uh, like the way to anybody, right? Because you just sent them a Google Maps link. But back when we still explained, how to find another place, uh, people would, you know, they wouldn't actually draw a precise map or they wouldn't go with a highlighter over a map if it wasn't super complicated, but they would give you signposts and they would give you like, go here uh, until you see whatever this bank or the supermarket and turn right and turn left. So this is like a, a handwritten, uh, a hand-drawn map here, an example. And people have thought about like, maybe this is kind of like something that we want to emulate. So instead of showing like here, what is it from somewhere? I guess somewhere around the lakes, uh, you, you move, drive from Madison, Wisconsin to, I don't know exactly where, what's the goal here? Yeah, my geography, Kalamazoo, okay. Um, so you could like, you know, there's two different ways you could draw that map. You can draw it like this, or you can draw it with the key information here, right? So here you only show like people roughly a direction and then you're on this interstate and then here you get off, and then here or in this interstate, and you take this intersection here, um, you have the exit and so on, right? So much more compact representation. Um, and so that's kind of like the same principle as we had for this uh, bus map earlier, but now in this case for car driving. And so this was a paper that was by a team at Microsoft, and Microsoft actually, when they still had a map product, they implemented this, right? They, they implemented this in the product, but this did go away eventually. Okay, so now moving on to uh, mapping data onto maps. And so the, th the simplest thing you can do is direct mapping, where you have one data point and you map that one data point to one pixel. Here is a map uh, that kind of like, there was a, a school shooting in Pennsylvania um, a couple of years ago. Um, and then a local newspaper has um, gone out and got public records data of gun owners and plotted with absolute precision uh, every home that owns a gun or every home where there is like a legally registered gun, right? What do you think about this? That's my question. 
Is it ethical? You know, it's public records data. Yeah. No, no, like there's a lot of, you know, there's a long history in the United States um, that you can look up a lot of public records data, right? You can look up when somebody got divorced, you can look up what a public employee makes, uh, and you can look up uh, who owns a gun. Um, then it should be ethical. I think so, like the address is not So we might have a data quality issue. Yeah. Yes, I think this is the, the key point, right? Uh, data is collected in one context. Like essentially, you know, if you have a concern about a particular neighbor, it might be a good idea to be able to look up whether they have a gun or not. Um, but it's not made for dissemination. This is not how what we had as what intended, what the state had intended, right? When they were collecting this data. Um, and so this aggregation step and this kind of like display step transforms the data from something that is probably okay to something that's probably not okay, right? Um, so, you know, just with visualizing data and making data accessible, um, you, you, you also have a responsibility to think about what's going on. Uh, my favorite anecdote about this was that uh, a colleague at Georgia Tech, uh, Georgia Tech also has all of their professor sal salary public and they suggested that they do a visualization of all of the salaries of the professors in the school uh, and uh, it was the, my, the, my colleague wasn't very excited about this project. Uh, he, he essentially told him to find something else. <laughs> so, um, like the, the, a little bit more abstract is now not instead of every um, person or every item is to like do this kind of like isotype idea, right? That we represent the person with 250,000 people in this case. So each figure represents 250,000 votes. And this is a bit of an attempt to counteract this idea of that land is voting, right? So here we kind of see, uh, you know, this looks like much more balanced. This is Trump Clinton election. And it looks like, you know, as it is roughly split down the middle in terms of blue and red, right? Um, the most common map type, if you want to visualize data, are these choropleth maps. And this is coro and not color, uh, something that it took me a while to realize. Um, the principle of choropleth maps is that area are shaded or patterned in proportion to a measurement, and each spatial unit is filled with a uniform color or pattern. So this is like an early choropleth map that we see about illiteracy in France, and you can see that the northern region around Paris was not very illiterate, but the kind of central region close to the Alps was maybe more illiterate, right? Um, but of course, this has all of these problems with population density. And uh, here's another XKCD here. Um, the PP of geographic profile maps, which are basically just population maps. Our sites users, subscribers, master steward living and consumers of furry pornography, right? Uh, all of them look basically the same because, you know, what we're plotting here is really just population background, not data. And so it's kind of like interesting also like, you know, uh, you, plotting just population is, is kind of interesting. And so here is like a, a 3D map again. Uh, and I, I, this is a little bit similar to our 3D yield curve, right? Um, there isn't really a good reason of why this should work, but it actually does, right? It's kind of like, it has this analogy of like big cities have skyscrapers. Um, and so that's why it, I think it works, right? We see that the New York metro area is very dense um, and there's a lot of people living in, in this particular space, whereas for example, LA has like, is more massive in terms of spread, but it doesn't quite go as high, right? Um, so this is also in, uh, interesting to, um, to kind of keep in mind whenever you plot uh, the map, that, uh, map of, the, of the United States is that you really have basically um, the Eastern, the Western seaboard, and then you have the cities and everything else in between is, is really flat. Um, and so the, another thing you can do to make this a little bit better is to instead of like plotting, um, plotting wins, just binary wins, you can pr you plot percentage of vote, but it still is kind of like a bit disproportional. And then if you do this with population density, you get to something like this. Um, this is a really, really cool approach. Um, 
that um, is about, you know, one problem that you often have with map data is, is this the kind of like this, this extreme difference between densely and sparsely populated areas. Um, sometimes trying to make certain conclusions based on small numbers is problematic. Um, and so what these guys here came up with is what they call a surprise map. Um, and the example here that they give is the, the leftmost figure here shows uh, like a crime record. So mischief is like a, a minor crime in Canada. Um, and what, like, what we're looking at here is normalized. Um, no, it's actually, um, this is the event intensity of mischief. And so what we see here is that Ontario seems to be like, uh, seems to be having a lot of mischief happening, right? But if you know anything about Canadian geography, that you, then you also know that Ontario is the most populous state, right? Uh, and so clearly this is kind of like expected. And so the next step would be to adjust this by population. Um, and if we do that, the mischief rate per capita, uh, we kind of like, it looks like these Northern territories like Nunavut and so on, suddenly look like there's a lot of mischief going on up there, right? Um, but you know, what's probably uncertain here is these are extremely small populations, right? And if you have these extremely small populations, you shouldn't really care so much about outliers because they could just be random noise, right? Um, and so they came up with this metric that they call sign surprise that considers both the population, but also considers like small numbers and adjusts that based on that. And so what you see then is that actually Ontario um, and Quebec both have slightly lower mischief occurrences than, than you would expect. And the Great Plains states do have a little bit more than you would expect, but this big outlier for the Northern Territories here uh, isn't quite as evident anymore. And by the way, um, this is why people also think that small schools are better than big schools, uh, because you have, if you have only 10 or 15 students and all of them are by chance really good, then your school might end up at the top of a ranking compared to if you have a high school with 2000 students, right? You're gonna be much closer to the average. And so uh, the, like if you have very small numbers, the top and the bottom are probably gonna be in like entities of these small numbers. Um, this is another example of this, um, unemployment. So here's the unemployment rate per capita on the left and right on the right is the sign surprise map. And so like what you essentially see is like a checkerboard here on the left where you see a lot of different kind of like, you know, you're trying to parse out patterns. What is going on here? Why is there so much difference? Why is this county here so different from everything else? And, and what's going on here and so on, right? But if you, if you consider like what you would expect to be random noise uh, and you calculate the sign surprise map, what you see really are, okay, there is a problem with unemployment in the Detroit area and there's persistent unemployment in the Los Angeles area, right? Um, and there's a little bit of it in Florida, but it's less, you know, there's less of these kind of artifacts um, that you have to account for. Um, here's like one of my favorite ORPLEF maps, like the density of bears in Finland. Um, and then, so people have actually scraped Facebook data to uh, analyze how, where are, which sports teams are preferred in which, um, in which regions. And so baseball is, is kind of like, uh, interesting because it seems to be fairly well split up, right? Teams are, they, uh, like people like, seem to like the teams uh, that are close to them. Um, whereas basketball is not like that. Uh, it turns out everybody in 2014 loved the Lakers. Um, and what really surprises me is that uh, everybody outside of Ontario and Canada preferred the Lakers over the Raptors, right? So, you know, you can tell a little bit about the, the, the um, loyalties there. Um, and um, here's another example. This is like a Bloomberg graphic. Um, and this is a cool um, kind of like use of Coreplot map because this here is actually like land use, right? So showing something like this on a map makes a ton of sense. Um, like, is it pasture range? Is it forest? Is it cropland? Is it special use? Is it miscellaneous or urban? Um, and you can see essentially that pasture range dominates the west, right? Uh, forest dominates the east, and then we have like the urban areas in the locations that we roughly know about. Um, and the cool thing about this particular one is that you could also scroll through this, and they would give you different perspectives on it, right? With, with the same data, so you you kind of like look at it, and now 
they kind of reach, like this is the, the map that roughly tries to approximate geographic location, but now they show you the proportions, right? Um, so like most of the country, like the land in the US is actually used for pasture range. And then uh, the second most is forest. And then we have cropland. Um, and special use is, is, is includes military. So there's actually quite a lot of land that is special use. Um, and then you see the urban areas. And then you, you can see that like the urban areas, you could squish them basically into New England, right? Um, and then you have your special use that is national park, wildlife areas, highways, railroads, military bases. Uh, and then you can like see here kind of a tree map breakdown and you keep going, keep going and so on. And so it's kind of like a really cool perspective on, on the same data and, and like use this kind of like a good mix of geographical location and then switching to other charts. Okay, so one thing that you can do instead of a core plat map is the, um, is the a proportional symbol map. Um, here you would use a symbol instead of a color and you scale the symbol according to the data. And that's kind of like the circle idea, right? Um, and so here we show, um, this is Bush Kerry, uh, the Bush Kerry election and we show the votes they got in each uh, area. And you kind of like get this impression that yes, we see that there are like these dense areas that have these large circles. But of course this doesn't completely solve the problem, right? Because A, like we're still using transparency here but we still get a lot of overlap in very densely populated areas. Um, here's another proportional symbol map. This was uh, in the in a, in a, uh, Clinton-Trump election. Um, and this was looking at where did each county shift from the previous election, right? Um, did it go to the left or did it go to the right? Um, and, you know, I, I kind of like this map because it's very kind of visceral. Um, one interesting outlier is Utah. Uh, Utah shifted hard to the left compared to previous uh, elections, whereas much of kind of like the um, middle northern region of the country shifted to the right. And here's like a, just another um, example of this. This is a little bit more complicated. This, these are glyphs. So here the height of these triangles um, is the total votes cast and the width is the margin in net votes, right? So you kind of like uh, have these two parameters that are shown here. And I think this is like a little bit harder to parse, but you know, maybe like the day after an election, people will spend time on, on, on decoding this and, and engaging with this. And I've shown this map before. This is like a, you know, here, this isn't so much about, uh, this is Katarina's diaspora where people moved after they were uh, displaced by Hurricane Katrina. Um, and, you know, this uses proportional symbols, but it extremely overplots in the region of, uh, around New Orleans. So, you know, I wouldn't use this map to try to make any precise judgments, but it also tells you, A, there were a lot of people that were being displaced and B, it looks like they were predominantly displaced local, but it also had like an effect on the whole country. Here's another example of uh, like where people in Manhattan uh, donated versus to John Kerry versus to George Bush. So you see the Upper East Side is, uh, tends to be Republican. The uh, Upper West Side tends to be Democratic. Um, but of course, people make fun of these killer circles that are threatening America, right? So, you know, all of the problems that we have with area judgments apply here. Um, they might be better than choropleth maps, but they're not always the perfect solution. Um, like some, a very specific idea, kind of cool, and I might've mentioned this before, is fat fonts. And so fat fonts try, is, is kind of like this hybrid glyph and, um, and visual encoding. So. You, in this case here, this number here represents 489. Um, and on a scale of one uh, to thousand, that means like 48% of the pixels in this circle are black. So the font is designed such that the overall appearance of it in terms of lightness as it balances between black and white is um, uh, corresponds to the number. And so you can see the one is very skinny versus the nine is very fat, right? Uh, so that's kind of the idea here. And then you can use this to um, plot kind of elevation maps, for example. Um, and so here's like an elevation map of like an island. Um, or here would be like a fat font for uh, population in, 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 in uh, uh, North America, generally speaking. And so this is kind of a, like a really cool idea. It's more of an art project, but still like neat. Okay, contour plots or isopleth maps. Um, 
are, you know, they show you some contours and visualize data with contours. And this is useful for many cases. So for example, here is um, a, a map of um, equal magnetic declination, right? So the magnetic field isn't perfect. Uh, as you navigate around the world, you have to adjust a little bit for the magnetic field. And this is from 1701. Um, we, we also use these contours in, in maps that we use for hiking or climbing, right? They show us elevation changes. So here we actually can count the rings uh, to know how much elevation we have to kind of like uh, face on our hike, for example. Um, and then contours are also used to kind of like show these cones of uncertainty of things like hurricanes, right? So I'm sure you've all seen this map that, that these are kind of like um, a predicted path of a storm. Uh, and, but here you show kind of like the extent of hurricane force winds and the extent of tropical storm force winds with a contour on top of it, right? And there's a lot of research now on um, like, you know, these predictions are always uncertain and how can we make sure that people make good decisions based on these kinds of maps? And so that's kind of like an interesting topic. So um, now I wanna move away, away a little bit from this literal representation of space to something a little bit between where we preserve some geogram geographic information, but um, use some layout that is better suited for data visualization. And that's chirograms. Um, and so again, we like recall this particular map here, uh, we have this distorted effect. And so what we could do is we could just change the size of these objects on the map so that we make a comparison between these geospatial entities a little bit more fair. And so people have done this before, right? So here's like an early um, cartogram where you show a population in 1916. Um, and you, you see essentially that each country um, back then is represented as a simple geometric shape, but it's also placed approximately where it is, right? So we kind of like have a rough idea of where each country is in the world. And so we can quickly see, okay, if we want to look at Japan, we will find it over here. If we want to look at the United States, we can find it over here. Um, and so it's kind of like a, a nice compromise between uh, geographical information and a better encoding that we uh, can use uh, for um, data like this. Uh, here is like a 2018 version of this. And so this isn't uh, like now, these are not quite as simple shapes, but it's, it, it, this is done with countable squares. Um, and what's kind of interesting about this map is that Russia disappears here, right? Uh, so you would expect Russia to go all this way here and also Canada is just a sliver along the border. Um, but of course, these are countries that have a lot of large, in, uh, large areas that are not particularly uh, friendly to be inhabited. Um, and so that's kind of like, you know, you have a, still a good sense of where things are. It does look slightly weird, but it is um, it's kind of faithful to the data. Uh, here's another example. This is just the world as we know it. And now these guys developed an algorithm of squishing this in like a slightly different way. Like here is by population. And then here we would have a different metrics like such as GDP. Um, so you can see that like the US and Central uh, Europe and Western Europe are very big, but everything else is kind of squished except for China and Japan. And, uh, and then we have child mortality or greenhouse gas emissions, right? Um, so what do you think about these plots? Yeah. <laughs> you know. I didn't know that though. <laughs> so, you know, I generally love cartograms. I think this is taking it a bit too far, right? Because uh, you kind of start losing the sense of where, like of the actual geography, right? I guess it, it makes this point that Africa actually doesn't have any, any noticeable greenhouse gas emissions, right? Um, but it's still, it, it, it's, it's a little bit too much, uh, at least to me. I like these more abstract uh, representations with little cells or squares and so on a little bit better. Great. It's true, yeah. Yeah, and, and you know, it, it, you can kind of say that GDP, like this is overinflated in certain regions of the world, right? 
anyways, this is this is still tricky to read. Um, like here, um, yeah. This is like a, you know, I think um, after the, um, probably like in, let's say in the last 10 years, people really started to think a little bit more about how to avoid these maps where you really represent mostly space. Um, and so what this map here does, for example, it represents each uh, map by their total number of congressional seats. Um, and that of course makes a ton of sense, right? It still, it still tries to preserve the shape as much as it can. Like uh, California is almost recognizable as California. and uh, Utah is a nice square, uh, but, it, uh, but it makes it countable, right? Like we know which seats are where, um, it kind of like uh, the, the rough geographic locations are there. It's kind of like a fair representation. Um, and so you've, you've probably seen these kinds of maps and there's now all kinds, there's like hexagons here, which I also like a lot. This is by the Guardian. Um, and then here's like an Axios version, a Bloomberg version, Washington Post version, Politico version, New York Times version, and the Guardian version. Which of those do you like best? Guardian, New York Times? Yeah, they kind of, I think those two here really hit the spot in terms of compromise between geography uh, and the data visualization, right? The big gap here just doesn't look good. And this here is, is really like, well, 10, 2008, right? <laughs> okay, flow maps. Um, flows are important, right? People move, we wanna understand how people move uh, and, and like, uh, goods move and uh, you know everything else is in movement around the earth. And so we need to be showing flow on top of space. Um, and here is like an early flow map. This is transportation of passengers in Ireland uh, in 1837. And you can see that of course, everything here is connected to Dublin. And so it's easy to get in and out of Dublin. And then I've already talked about this particular flow map in the introduction. Uh, this is just here for completeness sake. I'm not gonna talk about it again. But this is like Napoleon's march on Moscow. Um, an early weather map here is Haley's wind map from 1686. And so here you get kind of like these dashes that give you a bit of an idea of what the pre prevailing winds are in certain regions on the globe. And then this is like a, a map by Fernanda and uh, Vegas and Martin Wattenberg. Um, here you can, this is live data. So you can see the wind uh, in the United States here. And you can see that, well, it's pretty windy in, well, I guess, yeah, Utah is somewhere up here. So it's pretty windy here. Um, and we kind of like felt this wind the last couple of days, right? And they also have a gallery of some notable events here. So for example, Hurricane Sandy, uh, which you can see very clearly, right? So like uh, this, this technique here, I don't know exactly the implementation, but this is kind of like flow visualization. You would use something like line integral convolution uh, to render something like this. So I think this is just surface winds. Uh, there isn't, this is not for, you could of course do this, like this is what flow visualization, fluid flow visualization is all about, right? Thinking about how to do this in 3D, but this here is just wind on, uh, at surface level. Um, and then you might, from high school geography, uh, you might've had seen these kinds of things, right? Uh, cotton trade before and after American independence between Great Britain and the United States. Uh, you can see that there was like a ton of cotton trade before and then after the cotton trade really moved to uh, probably India. It's not actually shown on this particular map here. So you can do something like this. Um, and here is like a, a visualization that shows you how people migrate within the United States. Uh, well, this is dead, too bad. Uh, here it's kind of like, you know, what, what you could do here is you could click on any county and you could see where are people coming from and where are they moving to. Um, and, you know, it's kind of nice and intriguing, but then there's also this project here. Um, and this is where we came from and where we went state by state. And let's look for Utah. So here we can see that like most people like in the 1900s that were born in Utah stayed in Utah. Um, but then the, the ones that left, they moved to California or they moved to other states in the West, they moved to other states in the South. And then I can switch migration into Utah that people who moved here were mostly born in California, born in other states in the West. 
and then we have like born outside of the US that kind of like was a big bucket in uh, the 1900s and is picking up since 1995, right? So again, this is this question of this data, this is fairly complex data, especially if we also want to show this temporally and, hist and historically, uh, maybe this is a better representation here. And then another thing that they do very well here is um, they actually automatically generate bins. Um, so notice that California and Idaho are the only two states that are shown here explicitly, right? And everything else is integrated in, in uh, aggregated into a region, right? Other states in the West. And so instead of showing you like these are the people that moved to New Mexico, these are the people that moved from Arizona and so on, right? They they move all this together into one bin so that it's still readable. Yes. So this is about ranking, right? Uh, so that you can see what are the biggest ones. So you can obviously like uh, there's still the majority were born in in, in, uh, in Utah. Then there were like the majority, the second most popular, like the second most, the second most important source of people is California and then Idaho. And then here, this is a little bit tricky because other states, like I don't actually know about this. This is probably because it's aggregated versus individual state, right? So, you know, I, I generally think that this um, changing the order here might makes, might be a little bit problematic because the, the, the size of these bands in the middle here isn't precise. But I think it's like this is based on census data, right? So you should really re only read this at the at the full like decades. Um, and so yeah, in that sense, I, I think that the, the switching kind of shows you this. There is like uh, the the ranking changes. So I think yeah, yeah. So as the rank, uh, so like as the absolute value, how do you? Is there a way to represent that all? So like cross population. Yes. Yeah, that's a good question. So that's not visible on this chart. Um, so you could you could build like a version of this that instead of does area proportional does like uh, you know it takes into account absolute values, um, but it's not implemented in this version here. But yeah, that would be quite interesting. Um, here you see kind of um, the flow of rail freight, um, and there's something that I didn't know that there was so much. Uh, rail uh, freight happening in like the central regions. And that's probably because of natural resources being exported. Um, and then here we have, this is a video. Um, this is actually um, 3D data because it's flights. Um, this is like France and Paris, Paris here in the center. Um, and you can see flights, how they're like, how planes are moving around. And in this tool, you can also kind of like turn and look at elevation so that you can look at different layers at where people uh, where, where planes are flying. And it's an interactive, it's an analytical tool that was designed for air traffic control. Um, and so you have some kind of like neat features in here that they're showing here. So here's the pan and zooming piece. So this is the Paris area. And now it's kind of changing perspective so that we see altitude on the y-axis, right? Um, and so we can see that there's these flights are happening in layers. Okay, the last thing I wanted to talk about briefly is you can also use maps if you don't have geography, right? Sometimes these data-driven maps are, are intriguing. So um, the idea is don't use a map to render on top, but let the data make up the map. Um, well, let me jump over this and maybe show the thematic maps as a last thing. Um, thematic maps are not geography, but they use maps as an analogy that you can use to plot data. And so I like these, uh, again, XKCD. XKCD does a lot of map stuff. Um, the kind of online communities in 2007 uh, and then online communities in 2010, right? So that kind of like uh, engages us um, and like lets us think about this. And then people have built these tools and this is like a project by Stephen Kobarov. And what he's showing here is kind of like um, the, the, the geography of television, right? So there's the lowlands with maybe some kind of like 
um, reality TV, then you have soap land, and then you have right bank, and then you have left bank, and you have like toddler and sprawl, and you have the middle lands and so on. And so these, these maps are using kind of geography, uh, geography as an analogy to lay out some maps. And these are usually based on some kind of like similarity projection, um, but they can be quite engaging. And so here, like if we zoom in on the left bank, we see that there's like all the CNN shows and Larry King Live and Anderson Cooper and so on. Versus on the right bank, we have Fox and Friends and, and all of the other um, TV shows that you would expect there. Uh, I, I can't actually tell without zooming in here, sorry. But you can look at this link here um, and then you can explore the map. He has many of them. And then this is the last figure here. Uh, you can also use maps to make fun, right? Um, and that's it for today. Uh, thanks everybody and I'll see you all on Tuesday, uh, Thursday.